conversation with Elliot Wilson and Meek Mills. Championship is the album. Gang. Shout out to Title. We really appreciate it. Championships, the album is fire, man. Really dope. Let's get it. Welcome home, Meek Mills. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. Thank you to Title. Been here since the Flamers mixtape. Thank you, Meek, for dropping the album. The Chasers. Yo, Meek, welcome back home and welcome to New York City. We're looking forward to your interview. And thank you for holding us down. Thank Black you, people. Title. So I want to say shout out to Meek Mill. Welcome home. Thank you for all the criminal justice reform that you're trying to do. Excited to see you. Excited that you work with Cardi B because I'm originally from the Bronx. Oh, cut it! And um, yeah, much congrats to you. Meek, welcome home. We've been rocking with you from the start, from the rain, from the storm. It's sunny again now. Meek, I just want you to know I'm so proud of you. I bought my first CD from you in a burgundy car on Broad and Airy. I did my first meet and greet at a store on Broad and Airy. I'm just so proud of you, and I'm glad the world gets to see what Philly been seen. Go. Philly. <laughs> so championships is the best, man. Here to see Meek Mill and me. How's conversation with Elliot? You know, championships the best album out right now. He's going to kill a game. Can't no more to say, man. Meek is the best. Shout out to Title too, man. Meek, I have been a fan since Dream Chasers, like everybody else claims to be, but I'm a true, true, true fan. I'm now a super fan because of all the work that you're doing now with all the criminal justice reform, and we really, really appreciate you everywhere, not just Philly. Um, your new album is fire. I'm going to say it's too early. I want to say rap album of the year, but rap album of the year for sure. Title, thank you so much for the opportunity. This is amazing. It's going to be an amazing night. Thank you. I'm here for the conversation with Meek Mill, Crown, Title. You already know I've been rocking with the Chasers since day one. I stayed down through it all, through all the madness, through all the craziness. You know, we stayed down, we stayed true, and you're killing it now. You already know what it is. Yeah, I just want to say that I'm fucking so excited what you're doing for prison reform, fucking empowering the youth and everything. I just want to say that that championship album puts you on the map, people recognizing where you are, what you're doing. This is your season. This is me time. Philly stand up, BK stand up. I'm fucking excited. I'm proud of what you're doing. And shout out to you, Big Mill. All blessings, all love, and more life. Cheers to you. We're here in New York, representing Brooklyn, Biggie Baby. Here for title, Meek Mill Crown. Can't wait for it, baby. Let's go. Meek. So is Wilson from that. I got it I can from my friend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's going on? Make some noise. I said make some noise. In New York City, baby. What we doing? How we feeling? How we feeling? Everybody feel good? You chasing them dreams? I'm the GOAT. I'll take that. I'll take that. I'll take that. I mean, this is Crown. You know what Crown is? Crown is a live interview series with hip-hop's best. Uh, we're distributing now through Tidal. Shout out to the good folks at Tidal. Oh, um, man, it's been a hell of a journey. People are watching this live on Tidal, so you got to make some noise. You got to give that energy. You know what I'm saying? Let them, know, let them know how New York City does it, how Philly does it. We got Philly in the building? All right. I need Philly active out here. I need Philly active. I don't need Philly being all shy and quiet. I need Philly to be active, man. So, man, I've just been thinking about it backstage and seeing this dude, man. I, I've interviewed this man so many times on this journey from the MMG days to now to his, his path from the beginnings with, when I first, you know, connected with him. And it's just amazing to see how he's continued to fight this adversity and continue to deliver great music. You know, we've seen it more in the forefront this year with his battles with the legal system and, and putting himself at the forefront of the criminal justice reform right. issue. Are you educating you guys on that to see what these moves he's making? Make some noise. But at the same time, you know, he makes it very clear. It's not, he's not trying to be necessarily an activist. And he's also very active with that music, right? You know what I'm saying? The, what we love him for, the music also that balances out. And I think he really delivered. You know, when you put out a title, you say you're going to name an album Championships. You better deliver. And he delivered, right? Y'all like that Championships? Y'all got that album? So it's an honor and a pleasure, man, to connect with him to find out what's going on in his life right now, how he's dealing with things right now in 2018. I want you to make the loudest noise possible for my man, Meek Mill. <laughs> Crown.
What's poppin', y'all? <laughs> What's good? Yeah, meet me on the building. Yeah, what's up? Yeah, yeah. All right, we good? Let's settle down. All good. Philly in the building. Philly in the building. What's up? Let's start with this. Let's start with this, Meek, man. The, the feedback. Feedback literally, like, across the board. I think I, I, think I saw you. I tweeted, like, or maybe on IG, you was like, uh, you know, yeah, I heard you shut the city down, you know, here in New York with your album release party. Yeah, we had some fun. <laughs> <laughs> and then you was like, I woke up to all this great feedback. Like, it's, it's just been insane, right? The feedback on this album is just... Yeah, it has, has it exceeded your expectations? Even? Yeah, it's always important. You know, I spend like months and months in the studio at a time. You know, I rap all night, seven days a week when I'm recording in the studio. So, you know, sometimes you record 200 songs and you got to narrow it down to 19 songs. You don't really know what people going to like if you left off the good ones or you was too critical on yourself. So it always feel good to get feedback and feel the love. How Rich Porter says that I need to feel the love. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> it feel good. Speaking of Rich Porter, I think I, you had said that uh, the Pain and Full movie was the first time you had heard that Phil Collins sample. Yeah, I think right? that was the first time I ever heard Phil in the Air from uh, Phil Collins when Pain and Full first come on. <laughs> uh, I'm assuming everybody in here saw Pain and Full, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hip hop classic. Yeah, classic. I was gonna ask you that with the intro. I mean, do you put do you put pressure on yourself? Because obviously your intro is a hip hop classic. Like, how do you approach like? People expect a Meek Mill intro to be a certain standard. Uh, how I came up with that, uh, I forgot who told me. One of my uh, older homies told me, it was like, when you're giving out your demos and shit, most of the time, somebody give you a random demo, even if you check the demo out, you probably only give them 30 seconds to see if they hot or not when somebody hit you a demo. So he like, your first song you coming off for, man, you gotta, your first impression is your best impression. So I always believe that you put a lot of energy into your first song. So, you know, if it's the first time some ever, somebody ever popping your CD in, you know what I mean? They're getting a feel for what type of energy you fit to uh, put them through when they listen to your CD. Yeah. Do you feel like, would, would you, like, even looking back at Dream Chasers, the intro there, like, it's very clearly a, a, a rap classic. Like, what is it like to make that record that, like, in some ways, already defines you, because people think of you, they think of that record and what that means. Oh, I don't know. I don't even know what it's like. <laughs> For <laughs> real. I go off what the people feel, you know what I'm saying? And I always, even when I call my homies when I come out with a CD, like, yo, what it sounding like? I got my beliefs of what it sound like, but I want to hear the people's action and the people's feedback of mm. what it sound like. I never, like, been like a guy that been in, like, numbers. I'm not in the numbers or billboards or, like, like just political shit with music. I like making good music. I come from Philadelphia where you might not even have a beat. You got a rap. You might got to spit a 16, you know, right now. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Somebody in the crowd say they hot. Come up here and spit a 16 right now and we see if you hot. You know what I'm saying? So I always was really concerned of what the people thought about it. So I, yeah. I, I don't even really know. How do you take on that challenge? That Because, I mean, obviously you can, you can kill with hardcore records, street records, but you've always been a multi-layered artist that can hit all the demographics and please a lot of different people and make different type of records, like, how important is that and how have you gotten better at that? Uh, I've been listening, I know y'all been listening to a lot of CDs, been coming out, it's a lot of music that been coming out lately and shit, and you know, sometimes I listen to some of these guys' CDs and I like their music a lot. I would just take like one or two songs off their CD and put it in my playlist. And I always believe when you come in, I came up under the, like the early 2000s generation of rap where it was like DMX, Jay-Z, you know, DMX might pray to you, he might take his shirt off for the ladies. <laughs> he might get crazy. Get at me, dog. You know what I mean? <laughs> you got to do everything all in one. He being a street guy. He being a ladies man. Yeah. He's being Preaching. a deacon, a preacher Religion. all in one. You know what I'm saying? So I always believe that you got different people. We wake up. Some people ain't have a good day today. You know what I mean? Some people ain't balling. Out. Some people don't got money. You know what I'm saying? So you got to touch all different aspects of life if you want to put out a good project, what I believe. Yeah. What was the magic you think in this creation? Because I mean, you put a lot of hard work into it. But what what do you think it was that makes? I, I'm sure you feel this way, like this project being your best project. Uh, I'm older now. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I go listen to some of my bars when I was like 19 or 20. I'd be like, that was cool. Now, now I got older. <laughs> my yeah, rose red and my diamonds, blue shit like that. I I, I look back. I'd be like, all right, I'm more older. I, 
I spent time in jail and shit. I read a lot of yeah. books. You uh, learn more vocabulary. You you see more shit. I experienced more shit in life. So, you know, I could talk about more than what I could talk about in the past. So, you know, I think I got more talented. I'm telling you, rapping seven days a week, you do that shit month, 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 year after year after year. You know, I believe you'll get better. Yeah, you say you still put the hours in to become better as a rapper. Yeah, like, I go to studio by myself. Like, I don't got a team of people in the studio with me, like, a team of producers really like that. Sometimes I would have one person come through that make beats. I don't really even really like producers coming in for two, three hours and playing beats because once I hear the one beat I like, I just, like, put it on. I go right in the booth. I don't write my rap, so I go right in the booth and just spit it off the top of my brain and then piece it up until it come together. Yeah. Why was the approach with the album? And I've seen one sort of a criticism of the album. It's like, well, Meek uses a lot of familiar samples. He flips a lot of classics yeah. in his approach to the record. Why was that a decision to, to go that way musically? Because uh, that's the music I represent. Like I said, I represent the, the early 2000s, the 90s. You know, like, rapping now, uh, a major, major, like, the big shit that stream a lot in, in, in the music industry right now is not really based on, like, Lyrics, it's about good sound and music. A lot of the music sound good, but I come from the era where you come with content, you come with lyrics, and you know, that's the shit I grew up on, and I, I wanted to make them work. Yeah. A lot of the samples, like, I, I got nieces and nephews and, like, little cousins and shit. They never even heard these samples before. They just sound like a fire beat to them. And, you know, <laughs> this shit that inspired me coming up my whole rap career, and, you know, we just did it. And I think it's more challenging when you touch a Jay-Z beat and you got to redo a Jay-Z beat and be able to make it hot or you got Jay-Z, Rick Ross, myself on yeah. What's Beef, this Biggie beat. You can't, yeah. it's more challenging when you rapping over some shit that's already legendary. So it was just yeah. a challenge for myself, too. Yeah. Speaking of that record, What's Free, that's become like its own cultural moment. I mean... You made it clear to stay woke that you wanted the Jay-Z verse, right? Yeah, definitely. And you I said that. <laughs> I text that to Jay-Z, too. And I need that verse for you retired, too. <laughs> Real shit. I, I always used to say it like, I feel like I'm like, not. I, I, I hate to say shit like this. I never say like I'm the new Jay-Z or new Tupac. I'm the new Meek Mill. I want to be like my own yeah. way. But I represent, some noise for that. <laughs> but I represent like the path that Hove created, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. A, a young hustler from uh, Marcy Projects that became a billionaire, like, that's the shit I grew up on and the type of music I grew up on and the things I wanted to be. Uh, I spent a, a, a piece of my life sipping lean for a short period of time on popping perks, but that was never my lifestyle, the culture that I grew up on. I grew up on, like, being a hustler and flipping money and doubling money and trying to move your family out the hood and being a boss. That's what I came up on, so, you know. Yeah. Uh, I always wanted that Jay-Z feature, and he came through this time. Gave you a lot of bars on yeah, that. Yeah, shout out to Hov. <laughs> yeah, he did a 44-bar piece. When I got it back, I was in the bathroom. I just was standing <laughs> in the mirror listening to it. <laughs> Guru played it for me. Before I even heard it, he played it uh, for me through speakerphone, mm. and he just was going through it bar by bar, and I'm like, man, send that shit. I need to hear this shit the right way. Yeah. And when I got a chance to hear it, it was crazy. Yeah. You got Guru involved with the project. Speak on that. Like, I know you already have a great engineer named Cruz, but what did, what did Young Guru also add to your team in terms of... Uh, the actually, uh, Cruz and Guru actually had a relationship because Cruz used to work at uh, Rock the Mic Studios where uh, I think it was uh, OG Wine or Hovind them studio. Yeah, and yeah. I went to Rock the Mic one day. I ain't had no engineer. I'm like, yo, you trying to engineer? He engineered for me that one time, and he was my engineer for the rest of my life, for the, <laughs> for the next six, seven years. Let me and, up, Cruz. <laughs> and one day he was in the studio like, we need to get a real vet in here to help us break these records down and really bring the sounds out and make this album sound sonically good. Because you, if you listen to a lot of these songs, even like uh, the Jay-Z sample, like you're getting Guru to mix that. He could really bring that alive to a whole other yeah. level. And, of course, he one of the greats who actually delivered most of Jay-Z's music his whole career. Uh, why not bring the best in to get with me? Yeah. Back, back to Ho's verse, like, I mean, a lot was made about whether or not he was this and Kanye. What was more, what was your favorite part of that verse? Like, why did that verse resonate to My you? My favorite part is, I ain't got a billion streams, I got a billion dollars. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I be on. I, I'm not really into, like, yo, I'm, like, the top-selling artist. I want to be the one at the top of the Forbes list. Like, I see in the Forbes list, I, I, I'm always thankful and shit, like, just to be a part of any of these situations because I come from the gutter, but I still look at that shit and be like, man, I need to be number one. I need to be on top of yeah. Jay-Z and Diddy at the top. You know what I mean? That's that's what drive me. And 
I love music a lot. I love when people tell me my shit hot. I don't really care about the other side. I'd rather be the one that's caked up, bossed up, and got my family living correctly. You know what I'm saying? And doing it for my last name. Yeah. You did. Let's get into the deeper. To me, I also love about the West Free record is, I mean, there's also a deeper meaning. Like, what exactly, what is freedom? You know what I mean? To a certain extent, we have you here on the stage, but in a lot of ways, I know you made it clear that you don't necessarily feel free right now. Yeah, I'm not free. Actually, I'm on bail. If anybody don't know, uh, I got a two to four year sentence. Yeah, some crazy shit. I got a two to four year sentence. And uh, the cops that was on my case, you know, investigators got hired and really went through my whole case and top to bottom. And, you know, a lot of the cops that was on my case was found out to be dirty, was convicted of crimes and was convicted of lying in front of other officials and shit like that. So, uh... Being as though, shout out to people, everybody that tweeted out Free Meek Mill or voiced yeah. their opinion about Free Meek yeah. Mill. Yeah. Uh, the higher court system actually actually got word of what was going on because, yeah. like, with the system, really, anybody, I could have got washed away. If it wasn't for, like, the fans, the people, I would have got washed away in the system. Yeah, I appreciate that one time. Love. Yeah. Uh, I probably would have got washed away in uh, the higher court. Supreme Court is like the highest court. Yeah. And, you know, they granted me bail. Actually, uh, this is how I really went. This was a crazy day for me in jail. You want to hear how I started off my day in jail? When I, came <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think I started it off early in the morning and shit. I, I, I made some oatmeal because I, I hate the jail food. I don't know. If you go to Google and you Google a jail tray, that shit looks crazy. Or if you ever been in jail, some shit. We wouldn't even get it to our pets. So uh, I ate some oatmeal. Uh, it's, a, it's a kid named Ma Ma. We used to play uh, ping pong all the time. Like, you get to your ping pong. Yeah. <laughs> he used to always beat me in ping pong, but this day I shut him out three times, <laughs> beat him two more times, beat him five times, talk my shit. So uh, I had one to my cell, and I was talking to this older guy named uh, Eric Reddick, free Eric Reddick. Uh, while we in the doorway talking, Kevin Hart and Michael Rubin just come walking on my block. Like, we out on the block. Uh, I'm in a state penitentiary. This like everybody, most of the people on my block got, like, life. Because when you're in a, a state penitentiary, this like most people are sentenced in prisons like this. So everybody in here got real hard time. It's a few people that got small time like me. And uh, I see Michael Rubin and Kevin Hart walking in the door and shit. So, you know. I, you didn't know they were coming? Hell no. I didn't know they was coming on the block. I knew they was coming to see me. Okay, I didn't know gotcha. they was coming on the block. So uh, What does it mean to come on the block so people know? Uh, Like... You in the whole area, yeah. <laughs> this is where we live at. Like, you in the projects right now. This is like... So, uh, they come on the block. I'm like, man, come in my cell and see how this shit looks. So, Kevin Hart and Mike came in my cell. They like, it's not that bad. They trying to make me feel good. I'm like, what the hell you mean this shit not that bad? I got my boxers hanging up on a fucking string. Because, you know, you got to hand wash all your... <laughs> When they throw your clothes in the washing machine, your clothes got to go in the washing machine with everybody with clothes. So I hand wash my shit myself in the sink. So my shit is hanging up drying. I got all types of rags hanging up that I wipe my sink off and wipe the toilet off with and shit. So I'm like, yo, stop trying to make me feel good. This shit is terrible, man. <laughs> so uh, we left off the block. They talked to a few people uh, on the block. We left off the block, went on a visit for like an hour. I came back. Pop shit at the guy that I be in ping pong. Yeah, you can't stop me, nigga. I'm, I just had Kevin Hart come on the block too, man. Show me some love. <laughs> just whooped your ass in ping pong today. So uh, I went in my cell at 4 o'clock every day. They do a count. And at 4 o'clock, you've been there for five months, so you just doing the same thing every day. So at yeah. 4 o'clock, I watch the news and shit like that. Watch all the TV shows. So I'm sitting there watching the news. They like, uh, Meek Mill is free for Bell. I'm like, what? I looked at real shit. I swear to God on everything I love. I'm looking at the TV. I'm like, what? I start standing up. I start changing the channels. I'm going to every news channel. They're like, Meek Mill is free for Bell. And next thing you know, the CEO walking up to my cell like, yo, pack your stuff. We trying to hurry up and get you out of here before like it be too much commotion. Mm. I grab my pictures. I had the whole Instagram in my cell. I used to tell like, I used to tell, like, Kuhn, Milano, my sister, all my close friends, even Brianna. I used to tell everybody, like, yo, just send me everything that's going on on Instagram. I want to see everything that's going on in life. <laughs> so I probably had, like, 10,000 pictures, but I had, like, a separate batch of pictures where I had, like, my family, my mom, my sister, and, them, and then I had the 10,000 batch where I got, like, all the Instagram models, all the famous <laughs> chicks, 
<laughs> and you know, it was it was valuable because you some guys in there, they got 25 years in this shit. They ain't never see the fake asses yet and the girls with the new bodies, so you know. They all let like myself, what's up with these pictures? I'm like, yo, go ahead, yeah, you got this, you take this stack. <laughs> Gave him my pictures. I took my family pictures and my letters. Two, shout out to all the fan mail. I don't know if anybody in here ever wrote me, but a lot of people wrote me in here. I wrote, I read every piece of mail that I ever got, because it was a part of like my daily schedule at night when I go in at nine o'clock. I crack all my mail open, read all my mail. And it kind of inspired my album too, because like a lot of, in a lot of my mail, people always be like, yo, when you went through this situation, I seen you overcome that. I was yeah. going to college and I was about to quit going to college, but I seen you overcome that. Or some things you might have said in your song, I was going through at that time and I overcame it. That's what most of my mail was about. So I really felt myself. I'm like, really, when I rap and when I make a project, I got to really inspire people because most of this mail is saying that I'm inspiring it people really and I'm motivating people. people, yeah. people and, Next thing you know, they was rushing me out the door. I walked out the door. I didn't have not the slightest clue it was a helicopter out there. I was looking at it. I seen all these people outside and shit. So I jumped in the car. And when we made a left, I seen the big ass helicopter right there. I just got dizzy from there on out. <laughs> I was gone. Somebody. Yeah, straight. I went to the Sixers game. But all that shit, you could, if you really look at the footage and look at my eyes, I'm like dizzy the whole You're time. Not fully because, there. Yeah, yeah. yeah, hell no. I went in the house that night. Uh, you would think. I've been locked up for five months. You think I got some pussy the first night? <laughs> I went to sleep the first. No, I ain't even go to sleep. I stayed up in my bedroom the whole night and just was laying down, watching TV, the news, looking at my phone, seeing everything I missed. Came back in the house the next day. Ain't go to sleep again. Then on the third day, I ain't go to sleep. I'm like, yo, I need to call a doctor. I need some sleeping medicine. Because I transitioned. It was like a culture shock from being yeah. like, in the state penitentiary, chilling all day, and you got to, you know when you're in jail, anybody ain't ever been in jail? Yeah. Damn, nobody? Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, shit. Yeah, that's a great thing, but it's almost amazing. Uh, you know, when you, you got to transform, like you can't walk around in there like you missed a nice guy, like you yeah. got to adapt to the jungle. There's jungle rules going on in there. <laughs> and uh, when, I, when you come home, it's just like a culture shock. I'm coming in to an arena with 20,000 people around yeah. me and shit like that. So I was going, I was going for like a week. I sat down after that, after like the first three days, I Just sat down and fell right. back. Yeah. Yeah. But, but since that point, you know, you not only, not necessarily just worried about yourself, this whole issue of criminal justice reform, you know, you've brought that to light with, you, with the t stance you've taken. Why is it important for you like to go from that point where it's not just about you, but it's about now, you're gonna touch on this, this issue that affects others, and hopefully your light helps the situation improve. Uh, just being in a state penitentiary, I seen some fucked up things. Like, it was like one kid I was cool with. I used to be looking at him like, he don't even look like he's supposed to be in jail. He a nice-ass kid. So we sitting down playing chess one day. I'm like, damn, what you in jail for? He like, man, you ain't going to believe this shit, man. I'm standing on the corner. Cops pull up with a, a older guy in the back of a car. He point me out and said, I was shooting at him last night. They locked me up. He ain't had money for a lawyer. He was like, I just took a deal. Because wow. he was facing probably 15 years if he would have went to trial and lost. And he don't got no lawyer money. If you go to court with a, a public defender, like a public defender probably look at your case for five minutes, take you in the courtroom and, and, and try to swap it out. So I was like, damn, you just took a deal like that? He like, yeah, I took a deal. And just when you go see parole, like if you hear I had a two to four year sentence, like I could have got in three fights in prison and went to go see parole in two years, and they're them like, no, nah, you was acting up in prison. And people could have swung on you first. It's, they don't care about that. You got in fights in here. Mm -hmm. I could have ended up doing a whole four years. So when he had to go see the parole board, anytime you plead guilty to a crime and you go see the parole board, even if you didn't commit the crime, you have to plead guilty for it in order to come home. I mean, you have to admit to doing a crime before you come home. And me and him was having a debate. I'm like, Man, you shouldn't even admit to that shit when you go in here. You got to really let them know. Show them the paperwork. You was in college. Mm -hmm. You was doing great. You never been in prison. He still had to go in there and admit to committing a crime that he didn't even commit. He wasn't even the type of person that would pick up a gun. But, you know, having dark skin, hanging on a corner, a Chinese man, right? You ever see, I, sometimes I see Asian people. I be like, damn, I can't tell who is who. You know what I'm saying? It's like... <laughs> I know they look at black people the same way sometimes, yeah. 
I got white friends, they be like, damn, what's your friend name again? I be like, you've been around him 16 times, you don't know what he look like? And you know, they point up, they just pull up six black guys on the corner, him right there, you know what I'm saying? And, uh, for another instance, a guy I used to play uh, ping pong with every day, Eric Riddick, he had 27 years and I always was interested in that. Like, man, how you still getting up every day? Knowing you've been in here for 27 years in this one building, never leaving out this building and shit. So uh, he was just explaining his story to me. And one day he got a piece of mail from like the Superior Court judges saying that, yeah, we know most likely you're innocent, but due to the, the laws of, it's a law that they drop. It's called, it's, it's like a PCRA. And this is what I got out on a PCRA, Post, Post Conviction Relief Act in if you find out new evidence in your case, that's like a girl could say you raped her and 10 years later she'd be like, I admit that he didn't rape me. And if you don't admit the evidence of this girl saying this within 60 days, it don't count. You can't even get out of prison. So when I seen that, he had evidence saying like, they said he walked up to a guy, shot the guy. No, they said he shot the guy off a rooftop. So he, had a, he hired a forensic person, a, a professional where like the forensic guy went to the scene how, and, and you get a report from the morticians or uh, however that go, you get a report of the body, the body damage, which way the bullets entered the body. And it was somebody that walked up and shot him. He got locked up for shooting a person off a roof a half a block away and the angles didn't match on any level and the judges got hold of it and it was like, we know most likely there's an innocent man sitting in prison, but uh, due to the laws in Pennsylvania, there's nothing we could do about it. Yeah. So seeing shit like that was just like always crazy to me. And then like growing up, I, anybody see me talking on CNN on my Instagram the other day? Yeah. Uh, just like if the cops pull up on the corner and you run, for making a cop run and work, gotta jump over gates and shit, when they catch you nine times out of 10, they angry. They hitting you with 30 and 40 charges and shit like that just because you made them work harder. Or, for say a guy, a kid could have a gun on him and he could take the gun and throw it under the car. And next thing you know, I've seen this a million times. The cops are like, he pointed a gun at us. We're like, yeah. why nobody That's what you said, you was falsely accused. Yeah, of, do anybody right? believe you could point a gun at two, three cops and get away with it? <laughs> Fuck no. And this was before, this was before the camera phone era or before when every house on the block had cameras on the block now. Now, you know, city streets of America, it's a lot of cameras that come with this shit. This was in 2007, I think. A camera, they cops say what they want and do what they want and shit. So I seen that happen to so many people. I used to be like, man, that shit is normal, man. I'm just gonna take this shit to trial. I ain't do this. When I got in court, I seen a black judge. I'm like, yeah, she definitely not gonna believe this shit I pointed. I'm like, I'm good. If she see my mug shot, I know she gonna ask me what happened to my face. She ain't asked me shit about what happened to my face. I got found guilty of all charges and uh, Long the probation. rest was history. Long I was probation. on probation the rest of my life, my whole adult life. From 18 to 31, I've been on probation. So, like, the smallest infraction, shit, I do, I could go to prison for. Like, yeah. popping a willy, shit like that. Yeah. And you touch on it with trauma. Like, one of the most powerful lyrics is when you said, uh, watching a black woman take my freedom almost made me hate my people. Yeah, because uh, I always, like, when I got pulled up, when I got locked up by the cops, like, I'm watching two black cops. They probably about 33 years old. I'm, like, 18 years old. One of them got on the stand and, like, made himself cry. You know, that shit is like a, a big movie in court. Like, some of these judges and DAs and lawyers, they sit down with each other at lunch, and when they get in the courtroom, they act like they don't know each other. Or these cops go in front of these DAs probably seven days a week because they lock people up seven days a week. Mm -hmm. and, he like, I'm looking at him in his face and he really dropped a tear like, I fear for my life. If you apologize to me, then maybe I would think about telling the judge to shorten your time and shit. So she was like, would you like to apologize? I'm like, no, I don't want to apologize. I ain't pointing no gun at you. I ain't apologizing in front of no judge for some shit do. that I ain't do. But that was a black person and I'm just like, God damn. Uh, when I got to the prison, uh, it was this one guy and he cool as shit now, but he used to come to my cell every day. He was a CO and was like, Mr. Williams, wake up, man. You got to clean the barbershop up. You know, if you want, if you got to state time, you got to have a job. And I'm like, yo, everybody in here don't got no job. I'm not cleaning up in here for no eight cent an hour, dog. Lock me in the cell. I don't feel like being outside anyway. So he used to come to my cell and I'm like, as time and time went on, I started to realize or I started to watch everybody in prison and shit like that. 
Everybody like, man, I don't fuck with that nigga. I hate that nigga right there. Man, I hate them niggas. That's all I was hearing of. Hate, 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 hate on black on black all day. And I'm like, yo, we really got like a system of self-hate built up in us that we not paying attention to. Even when you go to like neighborhoods and shit like that, everybody killing each other. And it's just like a a, a black on black thing. I mean, why are we so mad at each other? Or when you go in front of somebody in a position of power, I would think when I got in a courtroom in front of a black woman, she would like, oh, I'm from the hood. And she from the area I got locked up at. She should know, like, man, cops killing niggas every day just for having guns on them, pointing a gun at a cop. And that just made me, like, almost bitter towards my people. Or even one point I got locked up in uh, probably 2014, I was doing a lot of charity. And I wasn't really posting my charity on, like, the news and shit like that. It's a way... I don't think y'all know, like, it's the way celebrities do that shit. I can say I'm doing a celebrity, a, a charity tomorrow in Brooklyn, and I can have my team contact every news station in yeah. New York Publicity and have 30 it, yeah. cameras out there. I come from the trenches. I never used to do that. If me and Lou Williams, we take 20000 a piece, we go buy a bunch of coats from Walmart because we it's, it's, it's November and we seeing a lot of kids walk to school with just hoodies on. We wasn't calling the news and shit like that. The news would get with and probably be one camera there. We wasn't really publicizing. We put on our Instagram. We wasn't really doing that. And I was doing a lot of charity in my neighborhood. And I went to court. I'm like, damn, nobody ain't speaking up for me in court. All this shit I be doing in my neighborhood. And you got, like, a black judge in here, black cops. My PO was black, too. She was the worst in the world. Just treating me crazy. And it almost made me bitter to my people. But I always know that's just a certain type of people who, yeah. who, are, who grew up in that self-hate. Mind frame, if you hear the song I'm talking about, uh, I just want to ball a hundred summers. I said, I said, I said, I ain't used to showing no love because we grew up in that hate. Like, we ain't used to telling them, damn, them sneaks fire. Or, damn, that shit hot right there. You know what I'm saying? Or a person walked by, I seen Deontay Wilder say this the other day. He like, we don't even speak to our people if we don't know them. Like, if you come out where I live at now, in my neighborhood, you come out, you can't even walk past your neighbors without saying hello or beeping the horn because... Everybody had love for it. You could tell that these type of people ain't grow up in hate, and we grew up in a in a certain environment where it wasn't even cool to tell. Our, we don't even tell our friends we love them. Like if you from the streets and you like a guy, it was like not even cool to tell your homies like, "Yo, I love you, bro." You know what I'm saying? And that made me bitter a little bit towards my people. But I was strong enough to overcome and think like, "Man, that's just a certain type of people who be on some hated shit." Yeah. Even if you look at like. I always tell people, like, even when I was going through, like, the internet shit, when everybody was popping shit, not everybody, when it was a group of people popping shit, I would tell, like, if you lost your job right now on every job you had, because you probably got 100 jobs. Uh, <laughs> but if he lost all his jobs and I just go into his comments and be like, L, I would feel like, I would feel like the worst person in the world. Like, what the fuck? I want to tease him yeah. because he lost his job and he yeah. can't feed his family. Like, why would I want to do that? I don't. That wouldn't make me feel good, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, that shit, and, and that really becomes from, like, where we come from in the streets, and this is, what, this is my point I always was trying to make, like, where we come from from the streets, it's a different type of loss that we deal with. Like, a loss to the middle class people is not a loss to yeah. where I come from. Fucking having an apartment of your own that you paying rent, going to work, or having your money in a house, taking care of your family, is you winning from the door. I'm At this time, I'm fucking, I'm living at the top of Beverly Hills. I got every car <laughs> you can imagine. My girlfriend at the time is a pop star. I'm looking at, and I'm getting confused. Like, what the fuck? I'm losing. All right, yeah, yeah. The, this battle rap and shit is, all right, it's getting yeah. kind of bad right now, but yeah. don't put no fucking <laughs> losing. What the, what the hell? It, it, it was confusing. I'm yeah. like, is people really running yeah. with this shit right here? Is y'all yeah. crazy? I come from Philadelphia. If you know me, if you follow me from like, Headshot days and like Young Bob and all the rap DVDs and shit. We was going through it with Reed Dollars. I, I'm talking about he was dropping shit on us. I'm in the house with my own homies. They like, man, this nigga is killing you right now. And I'm screaming to my homies, man, y'all dick riding this nigga, man. He coming at all of us. You know what I'm saying? It was like, it was so hard yeah. in the ghetto. Like, you know what I'm saying? It was different type of dynamics, yeah. so I was like kind of getting confused. I'm like, oh, what the fuck is going on? What is they talking about? Yeah. Do these people even represent what I represent? Yeah. And who's but you ignited, you ignited a huge rap battle there, and we have Drake on this album. Like, why was it important to 
get back and make a record together? Uh, a lot of people don't know me and Drake been contacting each other for a year, but it's like, I'm not with the fake shit. I'm not with the just try to act like I'm cool with you to do a record. I want you to know that it's, it's not that. We had a problem. If you fight or you got beef with somebody in the street, you don't want to have a problem with them. And then tomorrow, the next day, y'all got your arm around each other. You know, it take time. He got to be ready. Yeah. I got to be ready for that shit. Like, even Drake texted me last night. I don't even remember the bar. He said something about... I just looked in my drawer and seen all these Nike headbands. He said, it made me think about the time when you came at me about a, my headbands. I'll never wear these headbands again. <laughs> <laughs> Look, and there was one time, the realest shit, when I was beefing with him, I was sitting at the table. This is my first time I was hype as shit. I was with Nikki and shit. We going on Hov and Beyonce, like, come out and eat with us. This is, I'm from the hood. Hov and Beyonce, like, come eat with us. I'm like, damn, I'm about to double date with Hov and Beyonce right now. <laughs> This shit is incredible. Man, we get up in this joint and shit, so Hov got the playlist. He just clicking through shit. <laughs> he clicking through back to back. Come on by mistake while we at the table. I'm like, oh shit, what the fuck? So Beyonce and Hov and Nikki, everybody just looking like, they don't know what the fuck is going on. I gotta take a shit now. I'm like, God damn, what the fuck? I don't even know if they remember that, but shit, I remember that. It was crazy as shit. <laughs> but, but we always, we even text about that shit. Like, it ain't really no bitch. Yeah, so, you, so you can't talk about it now in perspective and, like... And, and, we big can talk about it. Me and my homies, it's just, like, if people go on, like... Like, you see how interviews is? Like, you might have an interview and you might say something and they might take a piece of the interview and turn it into a clickbait and then that's all you see. Now you got thousands of people commenting on a piece of an interview. It only, it'd be, like, kind of pointless to talk about shit when it's going on until people get a full understanding of it. So... Yeah. You know what I mean? I, I don't really get into that when that when a lot of shit is going on. I don't like yeah. to talk about it. But it's interesting with the going back record. You re, you and your verse you reference back to back. Yeah. Why well, wasn't important? Sometimes I used to be like that. She used to give me motivation because I came up off of that. Like I came up like if somebody shit on me, like if I I got a new car in the hood and a nigga that was the same age as me came through with a a car ten times better than mine. And he might not, we might not even fuck with each other. He might have rolled pot and grinned at me. It made me steam, but it made me want to go hustle harder and get a better car. So, like, I sometimes, I was in Miami one day. I was in a Lambo. I was just drunk as shit. Not, not drunk as shit, but I was, <laughs> I was groovy. Ginger ale. Yeah. Ginger ale. Yeah, for real. I was, I was a little bit groovy. And, um, <laughs> uh, Don't worry, we're going to edit that out. We're going to edit that yeah. out. Yeah. <laughs> Don't drink and drive. Uh, I just popped that shit on. I, uh, I was like, man, let me throw this shit on and see what everybody really, really talking about. And I heard it a bunch of times. Well, let me throw this shit on. And I just start riding to this shit. And the way I put it, like, sometimes I look at shit, like, even me going to prison or the rap beef. I be like, yo, my life is in the center of hip-hop right now. No matter if it's a rap beef, if it's a breakup, if it's going to prison and having yeah. people... This is a part of my life and my legacy. Going to be on my documentary, I, I believe, in 20 Absolutely. years from now Absolutely. is a part of my life. Me, I'm just happy to be a part of this shit. I'm from North. <laughs> I'm out the corner. I'm like a... Uh, I used to be the nigga... I used to be the brokest nigga in my team. So, you know, I'd be happy to be a part of this yeah. sh Everything that be going on, the for good, real. The good, the bad, real. the ugly, the whole thing. Everything, because I'd be like, I'm happy people have been talking about me. I remember chicks ain't even used to look my way. You know what yeah. I'm saying? So it's just like... Right. Everything is a big deal to me, so I always try to make the best out of it. Even when, like, I was in prison, I'm like, I'm going to make the best out of this shit. When I come home, that's why if you ever notice, any time I went to prison, I came back and doubled up my worth or tripled my worth when I yeah, came back. Because absolutely. I sat down in the cell and be like, yo, when I get out of this shit, somebody got to pay for this shit. I'm paying back in success, so get your receipts ready. I'm paying this shit out. I'm hustling 10 times harder than I, and I always, and I was, I was born with that drive. I grew up in a crib without no dad, so like, I'm like the only man in the house. I got a sister and a mom, so I always used to watch, I don't know what TV show I was watching where it was just like, a son had to take care of his family that I believed since like a little kid. I just always believed I had to have a drive to take care of the family. Yeah. You also have other amazing collaborations on the album, like with Cardi B. And yeah. I think I, you said somewhere... Yeah, shout out to Cardi. You guys weren't even in a studio together for a lot yeah, of this like, stuff, too. And, and that like, wasn't necessary in your yeah, mind. Yeah, I, I, I just say, like, when I used to deal with Nicki, I'd be like, who just called you to do a verse? Why you ain't just call me? We talk every day and shit like that. I just, you know how it is. Your girlfriend, if me and you friends, and 
I gotta call your girlfriend to do, yo, nigga, call me. That's how I, I was feeling slightly about the shit. So I don't wanna be like dealing with nobody wife to do no shit. I was dealing with one of her people that work on her team. He do the verse. I don't, rappers he don't said even. Her husband's my friend, so I don't yeah, like yeah. rappers don't even really do verses in the studio together. Like nine times out of ten, me mine is a little different. How I operate. If you see my Instagram, you might see Kodak, Twenty One, A Boogie, Fab. You might see every rapper in the studio with me within a, a week. J Cole. I like the vibe of having greatness in the room at the same time, so we can compete and we can drive each other to the next level. But she a girl. That's not like my competition or shit like that. I'm, I ain't. Inviting no girl to the studio to like try to compete with. Yeah, how did that song come together? The, the exact yeah, song? Uh, it actually came together from somebody on her team. He like, yo, you knew her need to do one. I'm like, hell yeah, me and Cardi need to do yeah. one. Brooklyn like Johnny, people tried right? to Johnny, yeah. people tried to make it like it was about Nicki or some shit like that. Like, yo, that shit was two years ago. Let that shit go. I want to do music with who I want to do music with. Like, this shit ain't like no... If I'm running a Little Kim or something, I don't want to not be able to take no picture with Little Kim because I used to deal with Nicki. I don't got nothing to do with that shit. That's some shit that got to do with some girls, and I'm going to do what I want to do, the way I want to yeah. do it. Before I came in this game, I was Meek Mill. I was doing it, like, the way I wanted to do it. I ain't coming in this game, like, dealing with a celebrity or having to deal with anybody. I was coming, doing it what I want, the way I wanted to. And the internet is so sensitive. They make everything about... Somebody like no. I, sometimes I post captions. A lot of these captions on shit that I've been posting over the last month is from my CD. I seen blogs taking them like no. He's talking about this. Or he's talking about that. I'm just tweeting random shit and posting random shit that's on my mind. Don't y'all do the same thing? <laughs> I'm like a normal person. Like y'all, you might you might be riding down the street and hear a song and you, and you hear a line. I'ma post it. Yeah. A girl might call you. Damn, you talking about me? Like I'm not even talking about you. I just yeah. But you talk a lot about like this transition from being in a high-profile relationship. Now I assume you're single, like talking about the pitfalls dealing with women out here in, in the industry and almost slip. Hell band. yeah, I'm single. You know, hey, almost slip. <laughs> I almost fell in love with a daddy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what you say? My dog said you got too many bodies. <laughs> if you single out here and you out here trying to find a girl, you know, you run into a few thotties and you might like them a lot. And then you find out like, damn, you, who hit that? <laughs> damn, I can't do it. You know what I'm saying? It happens to the best of them. <laughs> I remember when... I remember when but I remember when uh, Uptown Vibes came out, somebody was like, oh, yeah, but you know, Meek love the Spanish ladies, though. That's that's, that's why I you get Uptown Vibes. No, I love, no, I love my black woman, too, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, first and foremost, first and foremost. Uh, 2000, and I think when I got out of my relationship, I just, I caught a Spanish wave. Like, the Spanish <laughs> girls was coming at me. And I just had some Spanish fun. I had a lot of beans and rice. <laughs> you know what I mean? I learned some Spanish words. And you know, I just bobbed out. <laughs> so was that? So what, what is? We vibe the, out sometimes. That exact uptown vibes was like. Did, did Meek have a great night in Dykeman? Like, what inspired the actual song? Really, all the Spanish girls inspired me. I used to be like on boats with Spanish girls. They'd be like, put on Bad Bunny. I'd be like, put Bad Bunny on. <laughs> and then I used to see how crazy. I used to see how crazy how all the girls used to go when like some reggae tone come on. I'm like, damn, they going harder than anything. When this shit come on, and I got inspired when I was in prison. Prison is like based on Spanish and black people, so all the Spanish guys, some of them man, they used to speak English. They used to walk up to me with headphones and be like, "Listen to this." And most of them used to be playing on well. And one of them that knew English, she was like, "Yeah, we love Bad Bunny too, but this one right here, he from the street. He 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 locked up right now, and he was just telling me." I put his music on. I didn't understand what he was saying, but he was flowing. <laughs> he was pop. It, it felt he had. He was cocky and confident with it. And when I came home, one of my friends, Spiff, uh, he did with TV, Unwell, yeah. and you know we just linked it up. And Nick Patch, one of Dream Chase producers, he came with that beat. Now that beat got a Spanish feel to it. And you see the video, the girls in the studio, Millie rocking. Yeah, Spanish, just a few Spanish girls in it, the, and then once they heard that beat, they got start dancing around. I'm like, all right, let me try this right here. Venaki, yeah. dame they the only words I know, so I just don't fuck it. <laughs> Let's turn this shit to a rap. <laughs> another another strong uh, collaboration you have, but you also worked in the studio because I saw she sh shared some of the footage. They have Ella May on the album. On the yeah, 24/7 shout out to Ella May. Yeah, I'm a big fan of Ella May. Her song. 
like that was a song that really uh if you, you play it in a club, you might see a bunch of thugs and gangsters in the corner really singing this shit loud. That's what it did to us. We in the club singing this shit. I'm like, a song ain't made me do this in a long time. So I became a fan of hers. And yeah. You shouted out Boot Up in the Dangerous song. Too. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and actually, probably a week before my album got turned in, Mustard came to the studio. He called her through. She came through, recorded doing the spot. And, you know, we put it, it made the album. Yeah. And flipping the Beyonce classic. like Yeah, hell yeah. I was happy I could even... Get a Beyonce sample clear, you know what I mean? I just wonder. I like music though. I like mixing music together, and I think it, it sounds like a good song, right? Anybody fuck with it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you know, I just we just did what we did. You think that's based off obviously relationships and the respect right there? To get, yeah, to that was one of my best days in prison too. I, I woke up one day with listening to my Walkman. Beyonce was like, "Free me!" Uh, I was happy as shit. I was, I almost did a back flip off the tongue, like, damn, Beyonce just said free me, because yeah. I still be looking at it like I'm a nigga just from the neighborhood, no matter what. I never try to lose that feel of yeah. where I come from. I move different and I think different, but I try not to lose that feel where I come from. So, like, fucking hand Jay-Z shout you out, or uh, Beyonce shout you out. Like, Jay-Z is big. You hear Beyonce shout your shit out, you're just like, oh, shit, it's this is crazy. Yeah. So... Uh, that was like a good day in prison, and I, and I, I think that's probably based off of, yeah, it was. No matter where the fuck you at, you hear some shit like that. <laughs> and I'm at, I'm at a down point in my life when you hear people at that level really supporting you. You know, that shit give you energy and, and really give you a drive to keep going. Yeah, but you, I know you strike that balance though, cause you make big records. But I know like when you did Jimmy Fallon, it's important for you that I'm gonna, I'm gonna do oodles and noodles. I'm gonna do. More of a street record, more of a, a, a the come yeah, up record. Yeah, that's like. why I, the uh, the game is really based off the same strategies. Like go to Jimmy Fallon and perform your hit single. I don't want to perform. It's kind of awkward standing on a small stage and me being. If I perform dangerous, I'm just P and B Rock standing right here and Jeremiah standing right here <laughs> and they singing and I'm just standing there rapping. That should feel awkward to me sometimes. And if mm. it make me feel awkward, I'm like. Let me spit some real shit on Jimmy Fallon and talking about the oodles and noodles babies. Anybody grow up on oodles and noodles in here? <laughs> because most of the time, too, I was in prison, too. Like, I was locked up with people. All they got is the basic channels on TVs. They'd never get to even really hear no real shit no more. So I just be wanting to use big platforms to speak on shit that come from my culture. Because most likely, like, a, a, a radio single or, like, a, a hit single ain't really the ground of the culture, the bottom of the culture. And I be wanting to come from the bottom and really express myself on big platforms. Yeah. So that's why when I did BET, I had a choice to stay try woke, to man. do a hit song. No, I'm going to do Stay Woke. You know what I mean? I'm going to send a powerful message in yeah. and, and get my point across. And that's what I've been doing lately. How proud, how proud are you the lyrics? The lyrics, the lyric, what do you think are some of the best verses on the album? And do you think like the Oodles and Noodles verses to me really stand out? Yeah, Oodles and Noodles probably one of the best verses rapping wise, but you know every song got a different type of shit to it. So I don't know. I like it all. I did 200 songs. I, I'm the one that had to listen to it a thousand times in the <laughs> studio before I put it out. So I still be feeling kind of funny when I put music. I don't even know if it's hot no more. I didn't listen to it 3,000 times and I'm like tired of. No, when they come out and hit the streaming service, it sound new all over again. Once I see people like. I fuck with this. I get the feeling back from when I first made it because I make so many songs. I would make a song, put it on an album, and forget about it. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Because I didn't kept going day for day making songs. And uh, I don't really know what's my favorite. Basically, that 19 is my favorite out of the 200 songs I made over the last eight, nine yeah. months. And why 19? People could make smaller albums now. Like, it seems like. I, I had a lot to say. I've been through a lot of shit in the last year and a half. I got a lot to say. I got a lot to yeah. talk about. So, you know, uh, usually it's dangerous nowadays. Like, a lot of people that come out with songs, a lot of songs on their album, everything is so critical. Be like, you got too many songs on your album. You got too many samples. You got too many features. I wasn't worrying about that shit. If you, look at, if you listen to my music, Dream Chasers mixtapes, even from Flamers, if you follow my Philly mixtapes, I always have features. I don't, I don't care about making my CD all about me. People know I know how to rap. I came up rapping my whole life since a kid. You can watch me grow up on YouTube and get better and better. I don't care about taking a whole spotlight of the platform. Me and Lil Baby came out at the same time. I'm always still gonna rep Lil Baby, promote his shit. He got promote a great song my with shit. Him on his album, Cause I don't too. really care about that type of shit. My, my main focus is really doing good myself and wanting to see the next man that come, especially if you come from where I come from, do good yourself. That's all I'm about. So, you know, yeah. I mix music together and, and, and make great music and do what I do. Yeah. 
Why did you decide to do a sequel to one of your one of your strong records, Cold Hearted, and really touch on like t- touch on being betra- betrayal of friends and losing friends uh, and dealing with the Because it's all about really what I talk about rules of the game. Like you hear like sometimes you hear raps people like I'm gonna get the money and put my whole team on. I'm gonna make a mill, put my whole team on. Even I used to say that sometimes, but a million dollars, you can't put everybody on with a million dollars. <laughs> You'd be broke before you know it. You'd be back at the bottom with the people you try to put on. And it's not really about that. Like I spoke on a song where I say, one of my homies got life in prison. I talk to him seven days a week. I can't be like, yo, bro, I ain't got no time to talk to you today, man. I'm tired of keep talking every day because you ain't really doing nothing for me. Like I don't let it bubble down to that. Oh, when me and my friends was out on the corner together and I ain't had shit and my homie might have been hustling doing his thing. He taking his risk for his freedom and risking his life selling drugs. How could I think he owe me something? Because if he get locked up, I'm not going to do the time for him. So how could I think? I had bad days around my homies where I was like mad as shit that he got money and I don't. But I would quickly come to my senses like, Hell, I'm worrying about another man money. And as I as I got money, you know, of course, any time in time of needs of my real friends, because when I make songs like that, don't ever get it confused. I got a group of people that will never betray me for money. I got a family, a group of family that will never turn their back on me for fame or money. But through the experiences of getting money and having money, uh, you come from a place where, like, you might be the only one to make it rich out of a hundred thousand people and nobody knows what it feels like to have this or the burden where every time somebody call your phone, they're going to ask you three different things. Yo, what's up with you? Then you good? Yeah, what you been on? Hey, look, I got to ask you for something though. You be like, you hear it so many times, you almost know what's coming every time somebody call you. And sometimes you even feel bad when somebody call to really check on you and you thinking they about to call you about some money, but they calling to really check on you. So it get confusing because so much pressure get placed on your shoulders coming from poverty and the way that we our mindset growing up is like yo he owe me something I always let people know I don't owe you shit if I want to do something for you as my friend I'm gonna do something for you as my friend if you've been following me on Instagram you know I've been having my friends with me the whole ride I've been having like the same group of people and we did a lot even myself I had ups and downs my friends we had ups and downs I'm everybody is not making millions of dollars the way I'm making millions of dollars and we all grown men and we understand, my closest friends, we understand that we got to do what we got to do to secure ourselves. Of course, I can come in a time of need and assist you, but you have to have that shit in you yourself. Like, I don't, anybody got family members that got a whole lot of money? Uh, I don't think, they probably take care of their kids and that's it. Nieces and nephews don't come in the same bracket as their kids. I even grew, I, I, I learned that growing up from, I had like 12 aunts and uncles, 12 or 13 aunts and uncles, and my dad died. But when I, I got good report cards and shit, one time I used to be thinking that all my uncles had to give me money and shit for Christmas, and one of my uncles was like, yo, I got my own kids and shit like that. Like, I gotta pay my bills, I gotta spend my money on my own kids, and that was just a cold reality check. Like, yo, people got their own shit going on, so you gotta really, Fend for yourself in the world, and if somebody do something for you, that's just extra. Never grow up with the mind frame of thinking somebody owe you something because you got to You had to build being Elliot Wilson yourself, right? Yes, sir, I had to yes, build sir. being Meek Mill. Of course, my friends was a part of my friends and family was a part of my journey and, and 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 kept me sane and been a part of my life to help me get here. But I had to had a drive to do this, and I had to go through everything. So. Coming through this shit, I always, I lost, if you used to see me, I used to come to show a lot of people. with 45 <laughs> people. Now, I'm back here with like six niggas right now, you know what I'm saying? And these are six people I've been around forever, though, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. They, these, and I kind of got blinded by the lights because a lot of people attached themselves on me when I got on. And, you know, I'm just accepting all the love. I want to see everybody make it out the hood, shit. Yeah. We on a 14-seater jet. I used to pull up on my neighborhood. Yo, who trying to go to Miami today? Niggas like, bet, come on, let's go. When we coming back? Yeah. We got 14 seats. I, I I used to feel guilty flying from the hood with 14 seats, and I got seats, yeah. seven homies on the corner, and they caught up in the middle of a fucking ruthless environment. They shooting around here. I almost used to feel like if something happened to them, I would be guilty, but I had to come to, come to realization that we are grown men, and if I can pull up and tell people, let's get on the jet and shoot out, uh, huh, take this check and flip it and start your business and do what you do. If I can do that, I do that. That's just, yeah. that's regular friendship. But, you know, 
that was one of my biggest obstacles watching people turn their back on me about money and shit like that. Because when I was broke, I never dealt with, I never based my relationship with my friends or family on money. Yeah. Throughout the album, you, t- you sort of, I remember you, I, gave, uh, I know you respect Cole and like, it's a transition I think for you guys. It's like, you've been in the game for a while and like you're kind of young OGs now in a sense, right? And like yeah. a song like Respect the Game, to me comes out of that. Like you, you're speaking more from a perspective of like, schooling the newer generation of people in the struggle about the pitfalls of what's going on. Like, what is that transition like for you? To, like, you're not the young buck anymore. You're more like a, a, a OG, a young OG in the game, schooling the new generation. What's that transition uh, like I for just, you? I just look at some of, like, the younger generation, and I see a lot of things that be going on. Like, even, like, I used to see Takashi do, like, crazy shit that I know would get him locked up. He used to be popping so much shit on Instagram, I'd be like, I don't even want to say nothing to this young boy. This young boy start saying all this crazy shit to me on the <laughs> internet. But really, I just probably wanted to say some shit like, yo, chill, dog. You beefing with like 10 serious people at one time or you getting in a lot of drama. So you bring that type of energy towards you. Or uh, like, it could be NBA young boy. NBA young boy, he a little wild. But I met with him before he got on. He came mm-hmm. to my house and shit. We sat down. He told me how much he looked up to me and he respect my game and shit like that. I could call him and be like, yo, man, take take that shit down. If I feel like I ain't seeing him doing nothing crazy in, yeah. a, in a second. But I would call him and be like, yo, take that shit down. I'd be like, yo, man, that ain't cool. And with my music, I wanted to, like, reach out to, like, all of them. Like, Dirk, one of my young niggas that before he became popular as he was now, I've been knowing him for, like, five years. He was in Chicago. You know Chicago, they come up 100 guns and a camera. I used to be like, yo, you should be the one artist that just don't do that shit. It's like mm-hmm. giving yourself up to the police. I understand if you're in a crazy-ass environment, people dying every day, some people going to have to carry guns. That's what I was explaining to the guy on CNN. Like, yo, nigga, if you go look at my, if you go look at the news, we got a page called No Gun Zone, at No Gun Zone. Today, yesterday, three bodies found in the house. Three days before that, four bodies found in the house. This shit like Nightmare on Elm Street. So you coming out, these people that's dying look like you. You're going to want to protect yourself. And we ain't, so these people got felonies and misdemeanors. They can't get gun license. So being as though the fact that you can't get a gun license, you're supposed to live in this area and just die like the rest of the people that's dying. So I knew what Dirk was dealing with, but I'm like, yo, you should be the only one person that don't put 100 guns on camera and like flaunt that shit up to the younger kids. And I got a son. Like my son... He listened to me, but my son banging Lil Pump and them. He banging like <laughs> XXX. Poppy, yeah. He's banging Takashi. Yeah. Yeah. He banging Uzi and shit like that. So now when I Lil see drip. people, I be like, I tell Lil Pump, yo, man, stop keep posting lean all day, man. You got my little son. My son got dreads and shit. He got dreads because of these younger rappers because, you know, YouTube, they YouTube babies. They watch YouTube all the time. He look up to them, so I give them something in the air, like, yo, dog, stop posting that lean shit all day. Little, little kids looking up to you, and I'm older now, so I can really analyze and see it. Like, that ain't really what's helping you sell music. Like, I see how Takashi was like, yeah, the, the controversy and the trolling help him sell. Yeah. All right, you got on now, and you making some songs that sound kind of fire. Rock with that. Yeah, yeah you yeah, on now. Yeah, you got to do that. This is where the you money on. comes in at. Like, you, if you getting this shit, you can't go to venues. They say you bad. No tours don't want to book you. No booking agents yeah. want to book you for tours and shit. It don't really make sense logically, you know what yeah. I'm saying? And never forget this. If you come from, if you, if you follow the life of the streets or you even look at that shit, you can never be certified off the internet. Like, shit that happened on the internet cannot certify you in the street. Not even talking about him. Like, you could say the worst shit to me on the internet. I'm going to shoot you ten times. I'm like, yo, he just went, he just held his phone up and said he's going to shoot me ten times. <laughs> we don't fear that. We don't care about that. We come from neighborhoods where niggas is really shooting on a deli base. We don't, that shit is like, now it's not clown shit, but... Ten years ago, if you would have did that shit, yeah. you wouldn't be able to speak in the classroom. You would have to tuck your tail in high school if you was the one that went on a computer and, like, talk shit. Like, so, you know, yeah. it's times change, and I just yeah. try to give back a real message and try to update their rule book. Like, yo, man, get on some real shit, yeah. some thorough shit. Yeah. How beneficial yes, would you say? Yeah, real shit. No, it's just some real shit, too. Yeah. You know what I mean? How beneficial was it for you when you connected with Rick Ross and, and, you know, got sort of brought to the mainstream with MMG, like, those that period of your career? Like, how beneficial was it to have him in your corner at, at that time? Uh, Rick Ross always been in my corner. Rick Ross been in my corner. He the person that signed me. So, you know, I always look at him different. Uh, 
I flew to Miami one day. He was like, yo, man, I want to sign you. I'm like, sign where? What we got to do? <laughs> real, I'm yeah, fresh I heard, I heard you took, like, your last money and you wanted to kind of roll there in style well, or something. I ain't had my last money. I was getting money at the time. Like, mm. in Philly, I had Flamers 2 out. My mixtape, I probably sold, like, 40,000 mixtapes. I was doing, like, all the colleges, like, Dell State, yeah. uh, Penn State, uh, Morristown, Cheney, like, all the black colleges, some of the black colleges and shit. Near me, and I was charging 7500 so I'm doing two of them a weekend now, mm. making a little money and shit like that. So when I go down Miami, I'm like, shit, I'm about to pull up on Rick Ross. I got to rent me a, a Phantom or some shit like that so, <laughs> so they can respect my pull-up, like, so they can respect my whole game. So, he, you know, when you come in to do business with somebody, you don't want to be like, damn, I'm doing business. I'm going to offer him something low, and we're going to just sign him and do nothing with him. I wanted them to respect how I was coming, on, you know yeah. what I'm saying? And, I rented me a Phantom. That shit, the battery. I went to the mall. I went to Bar Harbor. The battery died on me and shit. <laughs> I called the guy like, yo, man, you don't give me another car. But instead, I went to Ross' house. Uh, we talked about it. I came back like a week later. Some people with me like, man, you don't even got to sign to nobody. You popping already. You got your city. I'm like, man, I'm rocking with him. He did. I'm a boss with me already. We did Pandemonium. We did... Uh, play uh, your part, maybe. Play your part. Yeah. I wasn't even signed yet when he did these, so I'm like, yo, man, put me on TV. That's I knew all I needed to do was <laughs> be put on TV, and I'm going to be a millionaire. And that's all I wanted was to be put on TV. He said, I'm going to put my money where my mouth is. This is when MTV2 was out, like Jam of the Week was the shit. <laughs> if, if you could be the Jam, I was the Jam of the Week. We had two of them. It was me, him, and Wale. Shout out to Wale. We had two Jam of the Weeks. And, you know, I, I, I turned my hustle up from there. You know, I, I made the best out of that. Yeah. What was that like being part with the self-made part, like being part of this rap crew and you guys was just shaking up the game? Uh, that was good because Wale, he lyrical, he hot. Ro Rose, lyrical, he fire. And just us three on a track, you always had to come with it. And we all was in different lanes. Ross was talking that ball shit. Yeah. Uh, Wale was talking that conscious shit. I'm talking that street shit. So we was just like mixing it all up and just making a, uh, cooking a salsa, basically, however you want to call it. Yeah. It was interesting. He was from D.C. I was from Philly. He was from Miami. A bunch of different coaches from different neighborhoods and putting that shit together. It was yeah. a good run. I had a lot of fun doing it, and I, I can't wait to continue doing it. I even, Wale tweeted one day when he seen the girls dancing around in the studio. He was like, that's why me and Meek don't got no song, because every time I come to the studio, I'm distracted. I like to record <laughs> like that. I like, yeah, you like a party in the studio. If they had a booth right here, right now, and... We had some hookah, so you know what I mean? A few <laughs> things. If you smoke, y'all roll up, chill. I would want to watch the way y'all bobbing your head while I'm recording, so I know I'm like, oh, yeah, this shit hot right here. I'm going to keep going on this. I, I go off the people, you know what I'm saying? So I, if you ever see my studios, you can't never say nothing about me. You see me, I walk in that bitch, no pen, no pad. Uh, 20 people outside the booth, everybody watching, nodding their head, and I'm watching their reaction while I'm rapping. And I'm really judging myself, like, oh, yeah, that's hot right there. I see how he moved his head, or I see how I'm laying a 24-7. There's 10 girls right there, and they nodding their head. They dancing around. I get a kick out of that. That's what drives me. So, yeah. you know, he don't record like that. So every time he came to the <laughs> studio, we just end up having conversations and shit like that, and yeah. we never really record it. But the love's there. The love's there. We're going to get some questions in a minute. But before that, um, but the other side of it, too, I thought was interesting that, you know, could you touch on, like, serious topics like, PTSD and stuff like that. And I saw something where you said, like, not you necessarily, you haven't really been a therapy. You say rap is your therapy. Yeah. Rap is my therapy. This is where I pull my pain out. I know if you hear me, like, I pull a lot of my, my real life stories out into my raps. And uh, uh, when you letting your pain out, it's like really releasing it and getting over it. And uh, we talk about, like, I came up with the PTSD thing. Like, when I see, like, the news and the guy go shoot up a mall. The first thing he say, a white guy, oh, he has PTSD. Uh, he was in the army and he seen the soldiers, cadets get killed. We like, yo, we've been in the army since we was three years old. Niggas right. been getting killed on our steps since we was three years old. We seen our friends get yeah. murdered. We can't go to court and be like, I'm carrying this gun because I got PTSD. In New York, you get three, four years, five years for carrying a gun. You can't go to court and be like, yo, I got PTSD, man. You could, And you could check the records. You know, they have records of everywhere a body dropped out of your neighborhood. You know, you could go get the records and be like, yo, I live at this address. 
35 people was killed in my neighborhood in one year. I probably seen 10 dead bodies within a year. Some of my friends lost their life. You can't go in court and be like, Your Honor, I have PTSD. I'm paranoid. I got my hands on a fire. That don't work in our world. You know what I'm saying? So that's why I said, it ain't no PTSDs. Them drugs keep it at ease. They shot that boy 20 times when they could have told him just freeze. Could have put him in the cop car, but they let him just bleed. The ambulance ain't coming, baby. Just breathe. <laughs> and I mean, just talking that real life, the yeah. shit that... It's hard to really, with a gay man, it's hard to get on these high platforms and really speak about this shit in yeah. a raw way yeah. and still get streamed and still get support. So shout out to everybody still rocking with that real shit. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Let me get to the people, man. Let's ask some good questions. Y'all got some good questions? Let's get that right there in the middle. What's poppin'? Now that you've been through... Say your name, say your name. Oh, my name's Jory. I'm from Jersey. <laughs> Jersey, what's poppin'? <laughs> We love you, Meek. Um, now that you've been through everything you've been through, what would you say, what advice would you give to your 10-year-old self? To my 10-year-old self? Uh, that's a, what type of question? How you answer that? <laughs> I'd be like, little maybe nigga. Son, maybe to your son. Oh, my son? Or ten, maybe uh, your myself, son. Myself, I'd be like, nigga, get ready for all this shit that's coming, boy, because you got a roller coaster ride to go through on the way, man. I would give him a warning and and tell them to toughen up and get ready for what the world has to offer. Like growing up, I seen a bunch of bad shit happening, so that was always waking me up like, yo, this shit is ruthless. A little girl just got shot in the head, I'm like, damn, what the, where's God at? What the fuck, how a two-year-old baby died? So I seen shit like that growing up, and I always just, always prepared myself for like the worst. That's why I said, I'm like, I'm doing good, but I'm ready for bad on uh, Respect the Game, because I seen a lot. So I would just prepare myself and give myself a speech about What's to come in the future? Fucking with the world, cause the world is there's a lot of crazy shit going on yeah. in the world. I know everybody in the crowd got their own obstacles they go through on a daily basis. You know, you just gotta be ready for it. Yeah, I know you're saying it was it was uh, tough for him to visit you, but you also kept it real honest with him about your situation. Like, it's always difficult, like with kids, to let them know what's going on. Like, yeah, your father's uh, in jail or what's going on with that. You kept it real. People honest was kind of lying to my son, not lying to him, but they like meek. He he out of town. And my, I talked to my son like after like two weeks. I was like, Poppy, I'm in jail, Poppy. And he like, you in jail? I'm like, yeah, I'm in jail, man. I should I, Hopefully I'll be home soon by your birthday. And he started talking about his birthday, and it kind of like fucked me up. My son like, what we doing for my birthday? Because I just told him I might be home by his birthday, but I'm just wishing for this. And I couldn't really give him no real shit about yeah. it. So, you know, that was like a, a hard thing really dealing with, breaking that down to my son. Yeah. Next question. Left side, right side, I mean. Uh, my name is uh, Sanjay from New York City. Uh, I'm Sanjay? A big, Sanjay. <laughs> All right, Sanjay. what's up? Uh, I'm a big uh, Philly sports fan, and I'm just wondering, coming out of prison, how did uh, like the Philly sports lift you up and, and help you coming out of prison? Uh, the Eagles actually kept me motivated when, they, when I'm watching the Eagles, like I said. <laughs> A hood nigga out of North Philly watching the Philadelphia Eagles come out to his song. That kept me motivated in prison. Like, even the night of the championship, uh, the Super Bowl, I made my food. It was like three, four guys in my cell. I already knew they was going to come out to my song, but I ain't telling people in my cell that. I ain't telling nobody on the block that was coming out. Everybody started running to my cell like, yo, the Eagles coming out to your shit in the Super Bowl. And then it was a great game, so it just was a good feeling. So, you know, uh... They kept me inspired through this whole situation, yeah. the Eagles and the Sixers. Of course, shout out to Michael Rubin, one of the Sixers owners. Yeah. Uh, you know, he rich. He, he wealthy and shit. <laughs> like, he like the real rich. He like not the type shit, not the rapper rich. He like the, <laughs> the rich, rich, rich. So how do you re build a real friendship with, with a man like that? Like, Because like, you guys have a very, very yeah, genuine person, friendship. Yeah, it's yeah. not just celebrity and, and businessman. Like, it's me, you guys have a very genuine yeah, he's friendship. he's a normal person, and we do the same things. Don't never get it confused because you see people, and he don't wear suits, but you might see people in suits and shit like that and, and looking preppy. They do some of them, some of them smoke weed, not just saying him. I don't smoke weed, but some of these people do the same thing as the shit that we do. Mm -hmm. well, he's a normal person. He's just white, too, and I'm black, work. you know? <laughs> no, for real, though. Yeah. I, that's how I really narrowed it down. Like, it's like... I sit around Robert Kraft, like, I would just be telling them the real shit we be on. Like, I want to know how you got to a billion dollars making billions of dollars, and he want to know how I survived all this fucking chaos and still walking around with a smile on my face. So yes, it goes sir. hand in hand, really. 
Yeah. And Vince, Vince Staples said you also kept your waves too. That's yeah. Shout cool. out to shout out to Vince Staples. <laughs> no. Oh yeah, when I came home, I did have was I brushed my hair all day. You ain't got nothing but time. <laughs> shout out to Vince Staples. He had posted like Meek Mill been through some shit, and then he posted again like, no, I'm not making a joke. I'm talking some real shit. Yeah. And shout out to him. I've been following him for the last four or five years too, since he yeah. first came out too. Yeah. Next up, we'll be going going left What's side. Good? What's good? Goody? My name's Ski. I'm from Brick City. You heard? What's poppin'? So I want to know who harder. Old meat, you feel me? Young, hungry, flamers meat, or right now, who are they? Right now, the old yeah. meat can't fuck with me. He said he don't like some of the old bars, some of the old bars, you know. You take the old meat and put them on flex, and you take the new meat and put them on flex, see what happens. <laughs> no, that shit gonna be critical for the old meat, I ain't even gonna lie. <laughs> How you think you've improved the most? Like, what, what do you think you, you, makes you better? Just like sometimes it, back in the day, it was one point where DJ Drama was like, yo, you got to slow your flow up. Like with the rosé reds and the make them say, I used to rap <laughs> real fast and shit. Like, I used to just love that up-tempo shit. Yeah. And, uh, everybody couldn't really hear me clear. Now I can slow it up. I could give you some melody. I could, I could crisscross the flow. I could dance back. I could do whatever with it now because I learned. I'm experienced. Yeah, boy, so. got yeah, man, nah, we had the mask. Right that. in the front, right in the front. My name is Mubarak. I'm from Yemen. Uh, what was that little drip? A uh, little drip gonna drop a song away for my man Will right there with the uh, like peach cert. He <laughs> shot his video back at uh, back at Made in America. I'm waiting for his songs to drop. Like little drip, he don't rap for real. Like uh, he think he a rapper you know. now. It's my son. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I be in the studio he, here in the studio. Now, right? Yeah, he's seven years old. I be like, yo. I give you 500, you go in the booth and rap right now. And he'll just go in the booth and late. And some of the stuff I'd be, his, one of his boys, he'd be like, Private Jet, who I met, Ben Simmons, that's a bet. <laughs> I, I couldn't even believe my son was even thinking about nothing like that because on his birthday, uh, we was going to Miami and one of us had a jet. And we all got him in Ben Simmons. We all went on a jet together. And my son was like, damn, I'm Ben Simmons. He kept talking to him. I'm like, yo, man, leave him alone, man. <laughs> and, Months later, he made a rap. That's the first bars that came out of his mouth. So, you know, I always kept on making him rap so I could Reality yeah, rap. Baby, reality. Right there, yeah. middle or oh, left side, right side of me. Yeah, yeah. Hi, my name is Poet from Southeast DC by way of B More. What's up? Two yeah. questions. We just shot a movie in B More. Shout out to B More, too. Oh, yeah, yes, you did. That. Thank you. Uh, one question. It's a two-parter. One, thank you for your New York Times piece because you were very transparent. I appreciate that. I'm an yeah. 80s baby, so Jay-Z speaks to me, but I think you speak to my nieces and nephews that I'm trying to mentor. Are we getting yeah. a book or anything? And as a person in the spotlight, we often told that you're not a role model, but you've been very animate about Black Lives Matter and us picking ourselves up. So do you think as a person in the spotlight, you do have a role as a role model when kids are looking up to you? Uh, I would say I made it out the ghetto out of fucking, I don't got to sell drugs. I don't got to, like, resort to violence. I don't have to, I take care of people. I take care of my mom, my grandma, my sister, my nieces. Uh, you don't have to call it a role model to me. This some superhero shit coming from not having no money yeah. and really working your way up and taking care of your family. Not even, like, not even counting, like, justice reform or speaking up for people. Just what I'm doing in my own personal life as a as a role model, you're supposed to be one that uh, a man, I believe, take care of your family, uh, pave the way for your kids and the younger ones that come up after you. So I, I've been doing that my whole life, and uh, everything else that come with it is just like out of good heart. Like I feel like I was put. Like I don't want to be. I always say this. I don't want to be like no activist. Like I don't want to. When I get off probation, I'm trying to blow. I'm trying to smoke a fat ass blunt. <laughs> I'm trying to like, I'm trying to like, bring my dirt bikes back out. I'm trying to like live a life of like, a young live dude that just live life. I wanna, I don't wanna be looked at as perfect. Where we come from, nobody is perfect. Like we come from a place where that shit is nobody in the world is perfect. But we come from a place where mistakes blow down the street like the wind. You get caught up in shit like it's nothing. So, yeah. even being a rapper, like when I got locked up at the airport, uh, God just wanted to take a picture with me. I'm like. I just woke up off the plane, so I got, like, coal in my eyes and shit. If you see me in the airport and I just woke up off a plane, I don't want to take a picture when I just woke up. I'm a human being just like you. So a nigga like, man, you bitch-ass niggas, you can't take no picture. I'm looking at it like, man, yeah, fuck you up in here, dog. Like, man. So mind you, he walks us all the way to the door. I go to my show, come back from my show. I get to the door. 
Who the first person waiting at the airport? <laughs> seven in the morning. The airport worker, he work at the airport. He's standing in the door, so Lil Chino get out, like walk over like, yo, dog, why you keep talking to us, man? He swung right on Chino, boom. Yo. Chino probably weighed 130. This dude weighed 260. I'm up in there. It's a self-defense. In St. Louis, they got self-defense. You ride for your family, right? Uh, yeah, so basically, that was a mistake. Me stepping in when a, a guy 260 fighting somebody that's my family, 130, which the law is in St. Louis, you can protect your friends and family if it's a situation of harm. Yeah, but it's a mistake that happened to rappers. Somebody snatched my chain and we fuck you up. And I get locked up for you snatching my chain and, we, and us really putting our hands on you. That's still a mistake. They will put it in the news. Meek Mill was locked up for a fight. That's the only headline you're going to see. So I don't even want to be in a position where you got me looked at as Mr. Perfect. No, I'm a guy from North Philly, from the streets of Philly. I'm a street guy. I just changed my ways. I changed my hustles. I changed my way of thinking, my mind, but I know that a mistake could come, so don't even put me in that bracket where you try to build me up and tear me down with one mistake. So I'm just somebody that's here to help. Uh, I got a platform to help, and I'm just holding it down. That's how yeah. I look at it. I don't look at it as people like Dr. Luther, uh, Meek Luther King and shit like that. <laughs> Martin, Martin Luther Meek. Yeah, Martin Luther King was marching in fucking civil rights. He was doing some big dog shit. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm making some power moves, but... Martin Luther King should be respected on another level, and I'm just doing what I could do. He said the problem was shooting a movie with Jada Pinkett's involved. Yeah, and, we, shot a movie. See, you know. we shot a movie about bike life where I actually was willing, and again, I ain't get locked up for it. Uh, <laughs> we shot it in Baltimore, and it's going to be a good movie. It should be coming soon. Yeah. Next question in the middle. Okay. It's on here, here, actually. Uh, Tanaja from Brooklyn. Um, and so, okay, you're not an activist or a crusader, but I was just wondering if there are any activists or organizations or people that you follow that you think you know we should know about who are actually really doing the work, in your opinion, to raise awareness about criminal uh, justice reform. I be forgetting names a lot. What's the guy? <laughs> of course, Van Jones. Van Jones. Uh, it's one guy, though, his name. What's the guy that came and spoke at my, uh... I don't even want to get caught up and not know anybody's names right now. Yeah. But you're using your influence to help build an organization, too. It's a lot, though. Like, even, like, uh, anybody, I believe this, like, anybody, and we need more activists, more people to speak up, and, like, more younger activists that's in tune, like, with what's going on with the politics of the world and, and things that concern us. Uh, use your voice. Everybody in here is an activist. You got Twitter now. Some of y'all got 5,000 followers, 3,000, 20,000 followers, 100,000. Use your voice and speak up and yeah, really be your own activist. The free big noise they made helped your situation. The yeah, I noise. feel like I got a bunch of followers. I'm automatically an activist. If you got 5,000 followers, your opinion and what you say automatically makes you an activist. So, you know, it's a lot of people I follow. and uh, I can't remember a bunch of names right now because... When you're doing interviews like this, I be nervous as shit up here, too, y'all. I, don't <laughs> I do. I don't be used to, like, sitting in front of people. I be, like, overthinking myself a lot. And I, I just, I can't think most of the time. Yeah, We got about two more questions. We'll get How you doing? Um, my name is Tiani Lee. I'm a music journalist from Philly. So I've been watching your career. Um, I see... Channel 6, AB, excuse me, <laughs> Channel 6, they uh, followed your career and they were calling you a menace at first, but now they're uplifting you, calling you the Messiah of Philly. So I wanted to know how that made you feel. Yeah, that, that really did something to me and that, that, that made it a part of being an act, made me like want to step in like the world of reform and, and, and just changing the way they view people like me. If, how can I be a menace? Do you, do you think the Philadelphia Eagles would be coming out to a, a menace of Philadelphia song, do you think the Philadelphia Sixers would be letting the menace ring the bell at, at a Philadelphia Sixers game? Would you think the, the governor of Pennsylvania, do you think Jay-Z himself, do you think Robert Kraft, do you think these people of, these, of this caliber would be speaking on a menace? And it hurt me when I seen, like, I went to court for a bell uh, to see if I could get bell. And the judge was like, I'm a threat to the community. I'm like, how am I a threat? I, that shit had me in my cell for months just thinking about it. I'm like, I've been on probation for, what, probably since 2009 to 2018. The only thing I have been in prison for since I've been on probation is popping a woolly and fighting back somebody that swung on me in the airport. If you follow me, 
and people is getting out of line and they pose a threat, somebody might get fucked up or something like that. You know what I mean? That's just come with life. You know what I mean? Uh, it comes with the rap world. Like, you got people that bullies. You you got rap bullies in the game. When they run at us, we from Philly. We like, y'all ain't going to bully us. We ain't going for none of that. So, you know, we carry a little toughness. But the farthest that's going to go is... I ain't even trying to fight no more, but defending the farthest yourself, yeah. anything ever would go is defending myself, like menace to society. Like, who created that narrative for young black people that's walking in the courtroom? Even if you get caught with a gun, if you ain't kill nobody with that, you you just trying to protect yourself, your, your life. How is you a menace to society? Or if you sold drugs, you might grow up in the house, your mom a dope fiend, your little sister eight years old, she a princess. It's baking soda and a, a boy you egg in the refrigerator. You 15 years old, they selling drugs on your doorstep. You seeing people make money. You trained in your mind that this is the only way that you can make money. You can't get a job. You're 14, 15 years old. You pick up some crack. That don't make you a menace society. That just, you're a product of your environment. And I want to change that narrative, that shit they be using in courtroom. Even with Takashi, he got the Rico. That's what John Gotti got. We know he ain't dangerous like no motherfucking John Gotti. He was doing some shit. Well, he allegedly was supposed to be doing some shit, and he was acting out a little bit. But the Rico, that's kind of like bullying. They trying to get that kid life. You don't, anybody here think he deserve a life sentence? No, hell no. If you ain't kill nobody, you ain't take nobody life. They, they got like a conspiracy act where like, if somebody around me is doing shit, I could go to jail like, yo, bro, my whole family from the hood. If you want to make it like that, I'm just conspiracy of being related to everybody I'm related to because I'm pretty sure some people in my family might not be living straightforward. And I'm not going to stray away from them because they're not living straightforward. They're my family. they all I got. So, you know, I, I want to change that narrative of what they do to people. And Takashi instance... Uh, I feel like he was moving a little wrong. He was doing a lot of little stupid shit, but he got the same charges as John Gotti. That's some real shit he got going on. Yeah. And I don't think they should be setting the narrative so high, you know what I'm saying? Even if it might have saved his life that he might got to sit down right now. He could have been killed. He could have got caught up in some drama. You know, he might have needed this, you know what I'm saying? Sometimes it was times where I shouldn't have went to jail for fucking popping a willy, but I could have gotten into something way worse, and I just... Pray to God, all right, maybe you might be staring me on the path. Now I came home, tripled my worth. I'm doing better than I was before I yes, went sir. in. You know, I take it for what it is. Let's do one more, one more. Yeah, my name is Andre from Mount Vernon. When did you realize you had a bigger purpose in life? Where you at? <laughs> uh, I realized I been, had a bigger purpose in life as soon as I turned, like, seven. I was like, man, I'm not being normal. I'm not a normal person. And, and that comes with self-confidence, like, I think everybody in here, no matter who you are, what you feel like you look like, or what you feel like you got against you, I think you should always feel like that you special. That's how I always got girls. Like, a girl ain't give me my, her number back in the day. I was like, all right, that's on you. I still remember. <laughs> Seriously, I just always felt like I was special. And some people would call it cocky, but I just believe to make it far, you got to believe in yourself way more than anybody else would believe in you. Don't yeah. let nobody else tell you what you can't do. Yeah. I watch people was like, People was like, Meek Mill finish. I'm like, y'all niggas is crazy. You understand? <laughs> I'm about to go to the studio and drop some shit for like seven months straight. You think I'm finished? You crazy? And that's what the confidence I kept to keep me on my game, the way to put me in this position I'm in now. Well, we appreciate it. So if it, you me. follow me and you 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 uh listen to my music, and if I ever meet you in traffic, I like to meet confident people who believe in themselves. Don't come to me and bring me your demo or your small business and be like, yeah, it might work. No, you, no, this going to work. I'm a, you got to believe. I like people that say, I'm going to meet you at the top. You know what I'm saying? And that's what I used to say. If I, when I run into rappers or people when I wasn't on, I used to do too much. I like, trying to spit for you and get your phone number. I used to be like, yeah, I'm going to meet you at the top. And, some of them people, they ain't remember me when I said it, but I ran back into them and was like, damn, I, I told you that before one day. You know what I'm saying? And that's what I like. Yeah, for real. I see you there. <laughs> it's lovely. I can't wait to see you all there at the top. For real. Well, Mika, it's lovely. You came through here, man. We appreciate it, man. Let her get man. her last one off. Okay. She's been rapping. She's from Philly, too. All right, let's do it. My name is Adria, and I'm from Philly. I'm sorry. I'm so loud. I want to tell you, Mika, I'm so proud of you. Like... I went to a meet and greet at um, the bookstore on Bryant area at 12 o'clock. Yeah. To see that. Now I can download your CD at 12 o'clock. I'm just so proud of you. Yeah, and I appreciate that. Like, that was like the hardest, that was, that was like the hardest level to get to the next level. This was before I was signed. I used to have to go to like bookstores. That was Barnes and Nobles. Books and Black and Noble. Black and Noble. And, uh, wow. 
I used to set up a stand. Yeah, Black and Noble. That's the pop from this bookstore in Philly. Get with it. And that's that's the number though. My, I told you I used to sell a lot of mixtapes. I bought my first one out of Burgundy Car. I brought in there from Meek Mill. Yeah, and that was the first store that really supported me in Philadelphia, a black owned business. And they used to let me, I wasn't even a celebrity yet, but I had like a little fan base. So I used to do like my in stores there. I said it. People ain't know I was in there, so I used to have to set my table up outside. I said it so you could see me if you walk by. Oh, shit, that's Meek Mill right there. Let me check out the city. So I appreciate that a lot. Uh, my Thank you for that. Is, I got to say, he's eight years old. He love you to death. His name is Dante. Shout out to Dante. Shout out to Lil Tay. And he ride bikes. He like he do everything you do. And he asked me one day, and it, it was scary. He said, Mom, when I get in trouble for Willie and my bike, how do you answer kids like that? They ask questions like that. Because I didn't know how to answer. Ooh, I don't know how I'm answering that. <laughs> learn how to hit them gears and learn how to hit that throttle. <laughs> and don't bang out, Lil Tay, and wear a helmet. Because, like, bike life was part of my life. Like, yeah. look. If anybody, and I want to get this across on here, like, if anybody follow bike likes, you ever see the pack when 50 bikes fly by at one time? Yep. If y'all notice, there's no other one thing in America that could have 50 black kids all the same, from the same, not even black. When we in the pack, it's black, white, Asian, but 50 kids from different neighborhoods coming together to do one thing. No violence being involved. Nobody is robbing. Sometimes they try to criminalize it on news like these guys are like robbers and, and drug dealers. This is where we come together and be free, and this is the biggest brotherhood. When you see me on Instagram and I'm riding a bike in New York City, my security in the car, they can't keep up with me. It's so much of a brotherhood with the bike life. We fight for it and we live for it that these guys going to protect me just because I ride bikes the same way they do, and it's like a a brotherhood that we built. Like skateboard, skateboarding in the 90s, they used to try to ban it and make it illegal. Skateboarders had to fight for that. A lot of people had to go to jail and get locked up for it so actually one day people could be free to skate around on skateboards like they do. So, you know, I'm a, I'm a real bike lifer. All the bike lifers will turn their back on me if I act like I'm, <laughs> I'm letting go to bike life and not continue to fight for it because this is what we got. And when we was in the hood and we had to be on the corner where they were shooting at all day, when we got our dirt bikes, it wasn't no woods, it wasn't no mountains where we was from. We ain't had no trucks to drive three hours away to go on the mountains. We put them on the street and that took us out of our environment and it made us free to do what we wanted to do. And, and we all liked the same thing and, and, and that's what we fighting for. So I tell Lil Tay, uh, make sure he wears his helmet. Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, me, so we appreciate it, brother, man. Wish you luck in your fight for freedom. Thank you for the music. Yeah, already. Thanks for having me, too. I really appreciate everybody that been supporting me. Make some noise for me, Make Mel. some noise for yourself. Yeah. Can I get a gram one time? Yeah. I ain't gonna lie, like, ever since I dropped my CD, my, my phone been popping all week. <laughs> Shout out to everybody in the building. Shout out to my guy, Elliot Wilson. You already know what's up. Shout out to Crown. We're in the building. Sincerely, I appreciate the love, y'all.